Well, thank you and welcome to St Mary's. You're very welcome here this evening for our second lecture of uh, our Unmissable International, International Lecture Series. So I'm very pleased that you're not going to miss it. Um, we had a very interesting uh, lecture yesterday evening from um, John James around uh, the... It's very interesting to see the, the relationship between the development of uh, Catholic education in America and the impact of events in England at the time and how that kind of formed some of the decisions and choices made by the American legis legislature. Mm -hmm. we'll get there in the end. But you know what I mean, the grown-up people in, you know, making decisions, the politicians. But just it was very interesting, that relationship between um, the UK and indeed the US. Um, and despite perhaps some of our contemporary politics, which we might want to make us see the differences that exist between us. There are many, many connections that exist. And this evening really is about another form of connections and how we connect with uh, people who might be seen as other in aspects of our society or indeed other societies. So we're thrilled here. The lecture series has been supported by the International Allies for Inclusion and the Ability Exhibit, which if you haven't seen it already, is in the, what we call the senior common room, just in the room opposite uh, the Waldegrave Drawing Room. And it's a travelling exhibit which is designed to promote the inclusion of people with disabilities through respect for others, comfort during interactions. Isn't that a beautiful sensitivity? Comfort during interactions and awareness of disability issues. Using a multimedia approach to demonstrate respect, comfort and awareness, the exhibit offers suggestions for, be for becoming disability allies and educators. And for all of us who are involved in, in the great nurture that is education, this is seminal to our, our vocation to teach and to educate. So we're thrilled. We have Marc Poussin and Karen Myers, and also Mary Ann Borgeson and Diane Richter, who I know have been um, in the exhibit uh, next door themselves. So we're thrilled to have you here this evening, and we look forward to you sharing your professional wisdom with Ooh. us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I don't think I've ever had a more beautiful introduction. So I would like, I, and the exhibit sounds so beautiful and exciting, and it is, and I'm so happy to be here. So I'm Karen Myers, and I'm a professor in the Higher Education Administration program in, uh, at St. Louis University. And I have probably been in higher ed for over, I've decided now it's getting into those, past that 30 year mark. And have been interested in disability education for a long time. One thing I really believe in is that, and this has come about over the years, is that the, it's so important for inclusion, inclusion of all people, but especially inclusion for people with disabilities, is to listen to people's stories, to hear their voices. And so what I didn't used to do is tell my own story because I was brought up by a very German Irish mother who, and father who said, oh, don't talk, don't talk about yourself, that's pride. And so I said, okay, I won't. And then as I got to hear about, share your voice, share your voice, I thought, but not me, other people. Oh, I'm going to just tell you about myself now. So you just sit back and enjoy. Uh, no, I, I promised it would, this part would be short. But I think it's very important to know that, um, personally, I'm legally blind. And I have been so since I was probably in high school. And I am from a family of 20 people who are legally blind, over 20 now. Uh, and we all have some type of rare condition that we found out at one time when they were doing research on us that we were one of two families in the, in the country, in the United States. So there is no cure at this point. All we know is our vision, no one is totally blind. We, our vision keeps decreasing. And light sensitivity, which is why I have the sunglasses on this evening. I might take them on and off, but that is one of the things. So all of us, all over 20 of us wear dark glasses. We are always um, bumping into things. And we have made it part of our lives just to joke about it. I wrote a little book one time about bumping into life with low vision. 
just you gotta laugh and so we do and our, my whole family has laughed about it but we weren't supposed to talk about it so I guess other people just watched us bump into things but the one thing that my mother did do is try to you know tell us to advocate for ourselves she didn't do a very good job of it for herself but she did say you know tell the teachers tell the teachers that you can't see and so I was the one with the good eyes and once I got into uh, Oh, when was it? See, in high school, and I couldn't see the, what did we use then? Not PowerPoint, but um, overhead. Anybody remember overhead projectors? Okay. So I overhead, and there was Sister, um, Sister Martha, and she was doing, uh, oh, I think it was Sister Mary Martha, actually, and she was doing uh, her, the algebra on the, on the overhead. And I thought she had a blank sheet there. I thought, what are people seeing? And then she'd ask them to do problems in there, talking out loud. And I thought, I have no idea what she's pointing to. Well, that's when I discovered that I am, it's very hard to see in bright lights and in uh, anything that was, had a light behind it. Anyway, that's one way of saying, that's when it all began. And then I had to tell my mother, I was the youngest of three, and had to tell my mom that, Yes, I couldn't see, whereas my brother and sister could not as well, and I drove for a while, etc. But anyway, moving on through my life, I was educated, and I got on for a, do a bachelor's in theater, a master's in uh, communication, and a doctorate in higher education administration. And I started getting very interested in disability, and so therefore, uh, I developed a class for, for disability on disability in higher education and society. And that uh, my students here this evening, uh, Diane and Marianne, who will be helping with the exhibit, they have been in the class. And uh, they could just tell you how great it was, can't you? Yeah, OK. Yes, anyway, Q, you, yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, no, it is, because the students got so involved and so excited about it. And it was then, which I'm going to tell you in a little bit, but it was through those students where why we have the exhibit, and now an international traveling exhibit. And St. Mary's University is the first place to have the exhibit. And it just gave me chills that I'm here and that you accepted us and wanted us to be here. So thank you. But that's my voice. And I have a lot more to tell. But I wanted to tell you a little about my story. So can I see you? I see bodies. And that's what I see. I can kind of tell maybe if you're a man or a woman. Maybe. I mean, I, real, I won't even try. I know John James is sitting there, and he's smiling because he does that. <laughs> but, but other than that, I don't know where everybody is. So anyway, but I, want, but I do want to continue on. And I know this isn't about us, but I think it's very important to listen to the voices. But like, because I think that if we don't give people the opportunity, and that's where teachers come in, opportunity, the space to share their voices, how will we know about people with disabilities? Otherwise, we make the rules. We make the policies. We society. But how do we know what? people want unless we listen. So that, thank you for allowing me to share my story. And I am going to turn it over now to Dr. Mark Pusan, my colleague. And I hooded him for his doctorate. So I'm very excited about him being this far in life. Anyway, um, Dr. Pusan. I could say she's a proud mentor or mama, but I will go with the proud mentor. Uh. <laughs> Again, my name is Mark Poussin, and a little bit about my story. I like this idea of the theme of story. Storytelling is so important. My background is actually, I was, I'm a former seminarian, so I was studying to be a priest. And I left the seminary for other callings. And the beautiful thing about that is you get to learn so much about life once you leave an educational institution. So if there are any students here, you will definitely get a lot more about life once you leave. The piece that I definitely started looking for is the idea about how diversity is so important to the lived experience. If everything is homogeneous, we miss so much. Um, I've got a quick story about that. I was One of my jobs along the way, because my background's in mental health, I worked at a treatment facility for priests and clergy. And I was in charge of a wilderness experience. I was telling Therese this earlier. Um, and the one thing about the 
this experience is I had to come up with a program out in the woods with, with the men. And so I did a, a Boy Scout camp training for low ropes and high ropes course. And the trainer took us out on the courses. And one of the events is we had to get ourselves over a 15 foot wall. We couldn't do it. And so the trainer looked at us and said, can you please reflect upon, nice, I, didn't, I don't think he knew he was a, talking to future, or this future uh, Jesuit, uh, um, I, I was attracted to the Jesuit spirituality, but he reflected on how come you couldn't get over the wall? We couldn't come up with a reason for, this, for, for the life of us. He looked at all of us and said, you all are the same size and weight. You cannot get yourselves over the wall. You need the diversity. That was my introduction to really understanding diversity. We need difference in order to understand the world around us. And so I think that's the wonderful piece about looking at what we do here at the university and training people to manage colleges and universities and how they understand students. And one of those ways is looking at students with disabilities. I want to preface some of this kind of back on what Dr. James was talking about yesterday evening. And one of the things about listening to stories is understanding a little bit about the Trinity. And, one of the, and I draw this from process theology. Process theology will take a look at the Trinity from the relational dynamic between God's Son and Holy Spirit. And the image and likeness of God for process theologians is, is the relational dynamic. And if we pay attention to that relational dynamic, then we see God. And I think those of us who then teach from Catholic education, and even if we're not teaching in Catholic education, is how do we see the mystery of the other? And I think that is part of the um, beauty of human beings in that respect. So what we're going to be bringing up is looking at disability humility. What does that mean? through the lens, lens of ally development, which is what we're going to provide you with that workshop. So we're, hopefully we're going to convert all of you to be allies at the end of this experience. But it's largely based on the Catholic intellectual tradition and the Catholic social teachings. And with the Catholic intellectual tradition, it is really looking at how do we pursue truth for the greater glory of God? How do we pursue truth to engage mystery. That is, that's the exciting piece about any of the work we're going to be doing with, with children and adults with disabilities. Particularly, how does this look with, uh, out of our context of college, our Catholic colleges and universities? The beautiful thing about the language of one of the documents in the Catholic Church is the Land O'Lakes Statement, and that's where Catholic colleges and universities said, we need to be autonomous from the, from the Vatican in terms of our research teaching and also uh, with um, our academic freedom. So that way we can engage more the mysteries. And to do this, the language of this document says we do this through experiential and experimental, <coughs> interpersonal and intrapersonal modes of learning. And humility is integral to that process. Because allows us to look at the other and say, I don't know enough about you. Can you tell me your experience? And therefore, then we engage the other. That's the beautiful, again, part of the disability, humility, or even looking at competencies, if you will. This idea of disability ally development that we're going to be talking about depends on humility and the value placed on the dignity of all human beings. That comes from the Catholic social teaching. In order to do so, that allows us to pursue truth enjoyed by having the autonomy and the academic freedom to do so. So with that, we're going to begin this experience for you. You know when you have one of those aha moments and you think this is really not a big deal but this has changed my life. Uh, I used to work in California, in Southern California, and I read an article in 2000, let's just say 2000, it was around the early 2000s, and uh, it was about disability humility. And it was in the, uh, a, a very small newsletter called Diversity uh, World. And Robert McGinnis wrote it, McGinnis, 
and he, and he talked about disability humility. In the beginning, he started with cultural competence and then cultural humility. And cultural competence is knowing about your culture and maybe other cultures, but you have the knowledge. And then if you're culturally humble, then you're able to interact with people and, and it's on a different level. But I hadn't heard the disability competence and disability humility. So at that time, I had gone through all kinds of Americans with Disabilities Act training that was in the 90s and lots of training. I knew the law and I knew accommodations and I knew how wide a door should be for access. And that's 36 inches and I knew how high a sink was supposed to be. And I really felt good about that, that I had the competence. And then I also knew about accommodations in colleges and I was a, a disability services director so I could do the accommodation thing. But then I read about disability humility, and I thought, oh, it's actually listening to other people. It's actually paying attention to the other, and then taking that in and seeing how, what you can do about that. So yes, disability humility is near and dear to my heart, and I, and I think that that is what my work is about. In fact, I just did a dossier to go up for full professor. I don't know if any of you done that or you know how poor, anyway. It, it, was, it was not a horrible experience at all, was it, Dr. James? But not at all, it'll be wonderful. But it's scary, it is, I'll admit, it was kind of scary. And, um, and I don't know yet, but my point is when I was doing my personal reflection, I wrote about that is my goal. My goal is to be humble, and my goal is to be, have this disability humility. So anyway, I just think that's a, a cool idea, and I really do think it did change my life, that small article. But we're going to move on. Oh, did I do it wrong again? Okay, we're going to move on, and I want to talk about the Ability Exhibit, and they can follow us on Twitter or on Facebook, and like I say, this was all developed by college students, so they know what Twitter and Facebook are. So anyway, that was why this is here. They said, well, people need to know. All right, then. People will know. Anyway, the background of the um, disability, um, the Ability Institute, and I told you uh, really about my own background. Um, I wanted to tell you how this all started. So I told you the, about the class that Diane and Marianne were in, and at the end I asked students to develop a project. And I really, I'm not one to just say write a paper and I'm going to grade it and then it goes wherever, on a shelf or in the trash. But I really want them to do something practical. Our class is very pragmatic. I want them to do, to act, act, right? So I always, in assignments, have them pre-reflection, experience, reflection, action. Always, always, and take them down that uh, Jesuit tradition. But I think I've been doing that all my life, even before I knew Jesuit tradition. So I thought, well, this works well, and I'm working at a Jesuit institution. and so. Uh, so in this action, one of my students said, oh, I would like to develop an exhibit, and it'll be about disability, and it'll be about everything we learned in this class, and so she did her PowerPoint and her presentation, and then she said, okay, and she thought she was getting a grade and was going to leave the class. Oh, no, no, not with me, because I said, oh, my goodness, we have to do this. This is so cool. And so within six months, I had several students helping, and we were able to get some funds from another institution on our own, and we developed an exhibit, a full 400-pound, 10-station exhibit with banners and posters and interactive uh, things to do, activities, and, then multi and it was multimedia as well. So um, we did that, very exciting, and it has now gone on for the last seven years. And since that time, we've been able to do two, ex well, two exhibits that look the same. And because we were coming here to St. Mary's in England, we developed a third exhibit. So what you see tonight in the other room and some of these, it's all new. And we were setting it up. It's, hmm. This is really new. We just got it like two days before we left. And it is the same material, but it is more, um, 
more in depth, more or more up to date, I should say, and then it has a different look. So the exhibit, again, this came from students' interests, students' ideas, and um, and then later on, one of our students got a United Way grant, and we developed a workshop, which has been taken internationally to Ghana and India and uh, Spain and others, and we're actually doing it in while we're here in England, and then. Um, and that was, again, one of my students. So moving on, <clears throat> so that was how this has, has progressed. And then the last thing we have been doing, and Diane is really instrumental in this, is we are developing a kindergarten through fifth grade ability ally um, curriculum. And we call it Ability Allies in Action. So Diane now and, and the other students who have developed the curriculum for each grade level, are we have included that in our exhibit as well. So we're trying to really start from pre-K, pre-kindergarten, through at least grade 20, but then on to the community. And so that's what this exhibit does, go out and about. And I really hope those, some of you have experienced already and others um, will after the presentation. So what we like to do at the beginning, uh, well, no, we're not quite at the beginning, but I'll, we'll move on. Perspective, I think it's very important to think about who do I know with a disability? Who do I know with a disability? And I think sometimes what we do is think disability, What's the first word that comes into your mind, or first picture that might come into your mind when you think disability? Does anybody want to throw out? Wheelchair. Sure, because the international accessible symbol or symbol of accessibility is the wheelchair. So we think that, but there are so many other disabilities. And when we look at the, the definition of the law, we will see that that broadens our scope of, of disability. So. Um, how am I doing? Okay, well, okay. <laughs> but I, this is, I like the, to do this just for a little comfort and intera uh, comfort between each other and interaction. Would you just take literally one minute, turn to, each, turn to somebody next to you and say, tell them who you know with a disability and what that disability is, okay? Okay, I'm gonna pull you back now. I know you just started that conversation and there are so many people, but what I'd like you to do is think about that person, okay? So now you have someone in mind. It might be yourself, it might be a family member. I always say if you don't know anybody else, you met me, so you have one person at least. So you can use me in this, but think about that person as we go through what we're doing this evening. So now we're going to get some, going to get some perspective. This is a very, very short video that you just pay, if you will, it's quick. So just, you need to be attentive. Um, tell me, he's going to tell me what to do. Let's see. I go over here. This is where this technology and my new friend Jack is so important. <laughs> Hello, I'd like to 
up in a bank account. of a person who does not have a disability, we're used to our world being that way. But what about the people with disabilities and what if the world was just all people with disabilities? There is a much longer video of this, it's called, or similar, that's called Talk, I believe. Um, and it, this was a, a French advertisement, but it sounds very British, doesn't it? And anyway, so the, the, uh, anyway, put thing, putting things into perspective. So when we look at people in the world, how many people do we have with disabilities? We say um, in the United States we have over 50,000, over 55,000 people with disabilities. And right now in the United States we have about 11% of college students with disabilities who have disclosed but we know there are a lot more out there. So then we go into why we think we need, we have our perspective now, we have our person in our mind, why do we need to be an ally? So why do we need allies? So let me ask, let me, I'll just ask you that question. Why do we need allies in the world today? Support, collaboration, friend, right, right. The big piece is these big pieces here, to pr promote inclusion and ability. Especially ability, diversity into the institutional definition of, of diversity. So in our schools, in our colleges, universities, in our workplaces, how are we promoting inclusion, difference, in other words? Oftentimes, I'll, I, when I talk to groups, I ask them, what's wrong with being different? There are many people who say, we have to be always alike. So this idea of difference, what is wrong with difference? The other big piece is to gain knowledge and change perceptions. It's another big reason why we need those allies. Now, in our institutions, especially our colleges and universities, it's also very important to have this, to be a part of the, the mission of the university, also a part of the strategic plan. In colleges and in, in, in workplaces, we can think the same thing. How do we support diversity in our workplaces based on what the values of that, of that workplace might have? So again, it's, it's much easier for those things are there. It's also very easy if we're also doing this from the grassroots up and we can inform our administrators what is important. So then we have a voice. So that's, that's the reason why that is so important. Now we have uh, another model or exercise here for you. And I'll just put that one up there right now. You have, uh, there's some envelopes here and we have enough for, let's do, let's do groups of three, and we have seven envelopes that we'll use. I think we have eight, but we have three groups of seven, I think we've counted. So just form into your little groups of three, and then we've got an activity for you. And what you need to do is to come up with which, um, You can do four. You have definitions in your envelope, and I would like for you to come up with what definition fits with these five models of disability. All right, so we have found through the literature that these are pretty much the, the five basic models of disability out there in the world. And I think it's important that those are pointed out, discussed, and figure out 
one in which that we probably would say from an allied developmental point of view, which is uh, the one that we probably found the allied development workshop and allies upon. So let's just go through these real fast. How many of you, uh, so how would, uh, what's the definition of the medical model that, that you've all, and you can just shout this out. How many would say that? You did the same one. There's your medical model. It is based on symptoms that need to be treated. Exactly. This is often what is used to figure out if someone is eligible for accommodations. You use the medical model. If somebody has a condition. But it's also a deficit. And it's, you want to fix it. Exactly. It's a deficit that needs to be fixed. So the next one is the functional limitations model. Exactly, and again, this, this is also in line with the medical model, you find accommodations. The other big piece to that is, how do you define normal? Yeah. <laughs> There's uh, a, a, a researcher that I like and talks about um, the norm is basically transactional uh, experiences between human beings. That's the norm, is that we actually relate to one another. And I've adopted that as my idea of what the norm is. So if we go into the minority group, which one, what definition do you have there? This, this model focuses on the common experiences of oppression and discrimination experienced by individuals with disabilities. Exactly. That is another one that's very common out there. It's got its pros and cons, but again, you've got the right definition. Let's go on to the social construction model. And it focuses on the elimination of ableism. Uh, how many have a different definition? If this model moves attention away from the individual and focuses on lack of social norms and ostracized people with disabilities. These two are, the, the social justice one and social construction are very similar, but that, that was the correct definition. So we're looking at how we determine the meanings of disability, and that's a social construction. We construct the different meanings that are attached to our, that social experience. And so therefore, then the last one was social justice. It explores the individual experiences of people with disabilities and the contributions of society. It focuses on the elimination of ableism. So we're after equity. We're after an equal experience for all. So those are the different models out there. And the one that, the one that resonates well with this idea of how we develop allies, and we're really looking at this idea of, of similar experience, interactive dialogue, is the social construction model. How do we create these meanings together? And that's this idea of social construction. And when you think about social construction, you think about society putting up the barriers, right? And so if we don't, again, listen to the voices of the people, how will we know what disability truly is? So the way I look at things is when I was talking about disability hum uh, competence, that is the letter of the law. What does the law say? We have several laws, right? And, oh, I'm sorry. Let me use this one. I think that too. Yeah. Okay. Because, well, in, in our, pro what we do in the Ability Institute is we do talk a lot about the United States because that's how, with us, that's where this, um, all of our work started on disability. So when we're thinking of the letter of the law, we're looking at the definition of disability. And in, um, in the United States, we had the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and we then had the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, which was amended in 2008. So the ADAA, a, one more A, okay, Amendments Act. Um, and then, and in England, there are two, my understanding, um, maybe even before that, but the, I had that 
written down so I don't mess this up. Okay, uh, the uh, Disability Discrimination Act, the DDA, yes, of 1995. And then the, it was repealed and replaced by the Equality Act in 2010. So I looked at the definitions to see how closely they relate. And um, quite closely, <laughs> we're both a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits, uh, or in, in England's law, um, substantially affects a major life activity. And then you need to decide and determine what is a major life activity. So a ma major life activity is a physical or mental or sensory health related. Now this is where, go back to when we talked about who do you know with a disability. Did, was it a person or maybe you've forgotten about some people who relate to that definition. Maybe someone who has a health-related disability. It could be heart disease, diabetes, lung disorders. It could be um, then when you think of learning or cognitive disabilities, uh, learning disabilities, attention deficit disorder, or you get into psychological disabilities, depression, anxiety, anorexia, um, bulimia. Uh, did I say anxiety? Anxiety, yes, because that one comes up a lot. What used to in colleges and universities, students had, a, a lot of students had learning disabilities and a lot of students had attention deficit disorder. Now we're seeing so many more students with mental health uh, issues and um, other health related issues. So our laws are very close, right? So as I said, these are the three, um, the, you, laws in the United States. And, but then the real gist of this whole thing, the, the allied development and the exhibit and the workshops are that we really want to grasp and empower and live the spirit of the law. And we can do that through language, how we speak. And one way is person first language, putting the person first and then the disability. So you're not your disability. Disability is a part of you. It's part of one of your many characteristics. I might be a woman with, I don't know, what color is my hair today? It changes. Um, I always have to ask the, the, my hairdresser, what are you gonna do today? But, um, so I could be a woman with brown or blonde hair, but I'm also a woman who is blind or who has low vision. So it's woman first, student with a disability, man with a mobility disability, or man who is uh, blind or deaf. So that's person first language. And interaction, we're going to show you, still coming up, right? We have a really good one. Okay, we're gonna show you one way to, um, learn about interacting with people with disabilities. And then another one is universal design. And that is where we make things accessible to all people. So we don't have to give specific accommodations to someone who is deaf, someone who is blind, but everyone gets uh, the same type of um, service or program. And we have information about disability um, um, universal design on this back, there's a big banner over here, and then there's a big banner in the front which is about uh, the disability movement in the United States. The other thing I did want to mention right at the bottom, that at the beginning we talked about respect, comfort, and awareness. And what's interesting about this is these three words came out of my dissertation. I, uh, my dissertation years ago was about uh, visual, people with visual disabilities in colleges and universities and their perceptions of communication and how they want to communicate. And three themes emerged and it was respect for people who, for all people, the golden rule. They said respect, just respect us, treat us as you would anybody else. Comfort was not in oh, you poor thing, but it was being comfortable around you and get, giving comfort. You said it very nicely and um, I want to remember those words. Uh, and then awareness is what we're doing tonight. Being uh, educating, right? Teaching people how to communicate with people with disabilities. And this is students in your class, 
people in your community, people in your family. Take it away, Jack. Very short. So see, you can laugh, it's okay. Uh, and I think that this video shows how to communicate with people with disabilities, language to use, how to become comfortable, and the other piece of this is asking. Is there something you need, or not even need, I'm not a real big fan. Is there anything I can do? Just like you would with anybody else, if you're holding a door from so for someone, do you hold a door for a person with a disability? Well, in this case, where the woman, that was a problem, you might be a little attentive to, oh, she's using that door as you know a brace to get in or a bar. But um, at the same time, I know one time there was a man who used a wheelchair and I opened the door for him and he said, I can get it myself. And after that, I thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But if I had stopped, the next person who came along and I held the door like I always do. Don't I usually 
usually do that? Yeah, I hold the door when you're coming in and anybody behind me. So whether you're carrying books or have a stroller or happen to uh, have a disability, I happen to hold the door. So that's just something. So that man kind of discouraged me. Now, if I put everybody into a group and said, well, people with disabilities don't want you to hold the door, that would not have been good for me and my own disability competence and humility. So um, I just go ahead and do it anyway. But again, you have to be sensitive, right, to what people need. So one way, as I mentioned, is about universal design. And there, right now, in I've been very involved in universal design for several years, um, back when it really started in, uh, not in the architectural term, which is actually for facilities and services, but once our universal design came out in the schools, then, or in higher ed, that's when I started to get really involved in it. But basically, universal design is making things accessible for all people with the least amount of accommodations. Uh, or the least amount of change. So when you take that into the university setting or an education setting, we have universal instructional design or universal design of instruction or universal design for learning, depending on what federal grant you got in the United States, uh, three different institutions, University of Minnesota, University of Connecticut, and the University of Washington, all got these grants and they all named it something differently. So I use more universal instructional design which was through uh, the University of Minnesota and that's the one I was more involved in. But basically it's making your curriculum accessible. So in my case, I'll use a very easy example. What I started to do is make all my syllabi the same font. Okay, so everybody gets a sans serif font, an Arial, a Helvetica, something without little curls or serifs on the end, which we all love to use, right? But it's not as pretty, but it's very straight. And everybody gets that, and everybody gets one in 14 point. Now, it makes it long, and they could make it smaller, but they also get it electronically. I always send it to them electronically. So that's something simple that we can all do very quickly. Another thing is to change the font on an email and make it, again, a sans serif 12, at least a 12 point or 14 point font. It doesn't look like you're shouting per se. It's not all caps. It's just a larger font. And as we age, I don't know if anybody in this room is aging, but I know I am a little bit. And as we age, I notice our vision. And I remember telling my mentor back in college about universal design, and he said, well, you know what? I started using it, and that's really good, because I deal with a lot of old judges. He was an attorney. I deal with a lot of old judges, and they're saying, wow, I can see that now. So I said, see, it works for everybody. And then if you work in student development, you work with students, student services, student programs, we have what is called universal design for student development. And it's making programs and services, services at, uni at universities, colleges and universities, and at high schools and elementary schools accessible for all. That could be anything from the height of your counters do you know that a lot of people, I remember our financial aid office always had a very high counter. And then someone uses a wheelchair, or someone's short of stature, and the counter's up here. And they, that's not very friendly, so they lowered their counter, or they came around the front. That was you know, a way to do that. Another thing is brochures on the wall. How many brochures have you seen that are so high? There was something, where was I? Airport. I said to the woman, I can't, not only could I not see up there, I couldn't reach up there. And I said, do you have whatever I was looking for? And she said, oh, no, we don't. But also, I didn't know what was on that top shelf. So it's something to think about, just very small things. So then we're going to say, what does universal design look like? OK, so when you're looking at universal design of facilities, does anyone know what this is? And is it universally designed? What's it called? Does anybody know? Drop curve? Drop curve? Drop curve. Drop curve. Okay. Drop curve, curve, um, 
I think it curb cut. And you have them all over here, which is wonderful. I mean, I observe that all the time. And in the United States, even though we're supposed to, there are a lot of places that don't. But it is a curb cut. And yes, it's universally designed. It has a graded slope, goes down. It has a tactile warning. You see the bumps and the stripes. So a cane is going to touch it, a white cane, a, a, a other type of walking cane. And it will be, you will be able to tell what you're walking down. And then it has color. And with those are different colors. Is this yellow? Does anybody, I'm colorblind too. That's another fun thing. Uh, but yes, it's yellow. But sometimes people told me they're red or orange sometimes. I'm not sure. But basically, it's a, it's high, it's a contrast, right? So a curb cut is a universally designed sidewalk, or in the sidewalk, it's universally designed. Do you, and why is it universal? Is it only for wheelchairs? No. Have you ever used a curb cut? Okay, why? With your wheelchair? We're what? Pushing a pram or stroller. Oh, pram or stroller. See, I'm learning all these new words. Okay, so yes, a pram or a stroller. Uh, what else? Have you ever used it? Shopping cart, maybe? Wheelchair. Wheelchair, okay. Um, suitcase, yeah. How many coming, you know, traveling? Definitely suitcases. Um, also, we've, I've seen bicycles and rollerblades and you name it is, uh, use the curb cuts. Somebody said the other day in my class, well, because it's easier. I was like, Does, is it so hard to take that step up that curb? But I said, sure, okay. Is this font universally designed? No. no, why not? Lots of curves, right? Where do we see this type of font a lot? Invitation. Yes. I, I tell you, I get these invitations and I don't know where to go. I don't know what time it is. I don't, because I cannot read them. So, and it's not just a me thing with my visual disability. It's a lot of people, right? So if you use a more, you, we should start that. I always tell people when I'm talking, let's do that, okay? Next time somebody gets married, or next time you have a graduation, let's go for the font that everybody can see rather than this font that nobody can see. But we all think it's pretty. Okay, that is not a universally designed font. So is this flyer, do you think it's universally designed? Okay, it is a very, and if you cannot see it, let me tell you that it is a very filled page, okay? It is not high contrast, it's got a lot of letters, um, it's just, they, is it col the colors are all mixed up. People have said to me, I don't know, I, I, like I say, I don't know the colors. To me, it's light and dark, but it's not very well universally designed. This one is a little better. There you go. That one's a little better. It stands out. It still has pictures, but it does pop out. Right, and the font is better. Um, it could still be better, but the font, the pictures are there, and they would need some alternate text if this is electronic, so that screen readers are able to read what those pictures are. This one also is a little better with more black and white, dark, and it's high contrast, which is important. And all the letters are a sans serif font: uh, Helvetica, Arial, Verdana, Tahoma. Other ways that you could, um, it also in this, um, I'll just tell you what that access hunt was. During our program, during our workshop, we usually then at this time have you get up and go do an access hunt in the building or outside about what is accessible and what isn't. But we're not going to have you do that. You can walk in and get wine. That, <laughs> that's fun. Um, but then the other thing I was going to tell you is that with YouTube, or um, you can learn how to caption. So be sure that all your videos and websites are accessible. That means that you need captions by pictures. And you can learn to do that yourself. You don't have to send it to companies. And you can learn how to do those things on YouTube um, if you're into that. And it'll also give you a tutorial of how to caption pictures. We can use universal design to uh, include students in our classes. 
So we talk about, you know, what is the law? And I think this is where it comes back to the law. It is so difficult because we're so busy and we have so many things to do in our classroom. How do we do this for every student? So if we do it up front, and if we, we may have to put a little money into it, but if we can make our classes universally designed in our programs and services, then everybody's included. You may still need a sign language interpreter. You do may have to pay for that. And you may need braille if somebody to is totally blind and that is the way they read. But other than that, most, most materials, curriculum can be made universally designed. And there are a lot of websites on this, books on this, so we'd be happy to give you more resources. It benefits everyone and it excludes no one. Then we get into the language which we really talked about. What's wrong with these words? I am not handicapped. Does anybody know? If we're looking at person first language, what would we say? It's missing the word person. Okay. I am a person. I'm not now, person. I am not I'm handicapped. Person. Okay. I'm a okay. I'm a person with a disability. Because when we think of handicapped, those are the old laws, at least in the United States. Handicapped was out of the Rehabilitation Act. It is a very old antiquated term, some people consider it very um, detrimental or, or um, definitely a, a negative term. So we say I am a person with a disability, just as simple as that. We don't have to describe him, it's the guy who uses the crutches, but we could if we wanted to, but why? Um, and we talked about uh, first person narrative, and then, actually, Dr. Poussin was, was just finishing up with the ally. What is one? And actually, you talked a little about that before. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the nice things about looking at universal design, again, if you think about how many of you are going to be, or you teach already, is the <coughs> idea of how do you put this in the classroom. I had an occupational therapist one time tell me that if you've got a, a student with uh, attention deficit disorder and say they have the hyperactivity type, put up a table in the back of the room so that they can they stand at the table and move around. Because the piece about that is we all need some sort of stimulation to help us focus. Some of us need more, some of us need less. And for those students maybe with attention deficit disorder, they need more stimulus in order to focus instead of telling them to sit in a desk and sit still. That is more distracting for them than if they're able to move around somewhat. That's another piece in the classroom that you could use to use universal design. Similar with if you've got some, a student on the autism spectrum, think about if you need a quiet room or a destimulating de de room so that anybody, if they so choose, they were having, they're overwhelmed that day, they can walk into this very quiet sanctuary, if you will, and just calm down. Those are pieces that we can do in our schools and any type of our, our settings that are very universal designed. That's a part of being about an ally because about the part about being an ally is that uh, we are taking a look at what a member of an advantaged social group and we use what we have to take a stand against social injustice directed at targeted groups. Or the word in the literature these days is minoritized. And works to be an agent of social change rather than an, an agent of oppression. It's very popular in, in, in rhetoric these days to talk about our uh, oppression as well as privilege. And there's many ways that that can be uh, viewed in our world today. So in a ways, how do we be a so social change agents with those which we are aligning ourselves. How are we doing on time? Okay, so we have another activity for you. <laughs> they can and do this just on there. You want to do that? Yeah. What? This, is, this is about, we have about 20 minutes? Is that what you said? Yes. Or less? 15? You tell me. Easy. Yes, 15. 
It's actually. We have to keep you active. It's actually this one right there. What? There we go. You're getting my mental health background because I also think in terms of how do you create treatment plans is similar to a lesson plan. So in this way, we've got an action planning worksheet. So with this, why don't you just take a look at it, read it, and start forming some ideas. And therefore, then you can walk out with it because we're very Jesuit when it comes to this. We want to provide you with an experience. We're reflecting upon it throughout this, and we want you to act upon it. So the charge is, how are you going to act upon this? So as you are taking a look at this action worksheet, if something strikes you right off the bat, turn to the person next to you and say, I'm going to do this. Then Dr. Myers is also going to hand out a statement for you on a card that says, I will. And this is something you can put up on your mirror, on your dashboard, in your car. Things that you can remind you that what you will be doing once you leave here. Okay, so this is very, this I will, our students came up with at the end of the exhibit because they said, you know, people need to walk away with something, not just, what did you learn today? Oh, I learned about universal design or the disability movement. But what are you going to do? What's the action? Some very simple things that I think you could do almost on your way home or the next time you get in front of a computer is change your font. Change your email font. It's hard to do on phones, <laughs> but, and I keep saying to people, what did you get from me? Oh, you got a small times Roman. No, 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 that's not what I'm about, but, or what I do. But change the font, change a website, hand, uh, the, your next handout, what you see in front of you is uh, probably Helv, I'm not sure which one, Helvetica I was gonna say, but, or a, a type of font that's about a 12, 14 point font then that's something you can do so easily. Or use inclusive language. The other thing I did wanna say is you will hear people say, I am disabled. And that is identity first language. Instead of person first, they use identity because they see their identity as first. Simi Linton, uh, writer, uh, educator in the United States, is um, believes she is disabled. She says, I own that minority group model. I mean, I take ownership of my own disability. I believe that I am part of that group. Whereas I see myself as a person with a disability, a woman with a disability. So it's just different. It's person first, it's identity first, but it's inclusive language. Both of those are inclusive and not negative. That's not neg or, well, most people do not believe it's negative. I think person first language is more uh, a universally designed language as well. And then once you talk to someone and they say, no, I'm not a person with a disability, I am a disabled woman, then you say, okay. <laughs> and then you talk to them using that language. Right? So the last thing you have there is the pledge. We, like, we not only go have you leave and say, I will do something, but it's also I pledge to be an ally. Now you, this is for you, you do not need to sign it if you don't, if you, um, do not want to, of course, but if you see yourself as taking those actions, if you see yourself being that person that you can be an ally for people with disabilities, then you do sign that. I believe at the end of the workshops, it's up to you if you want to give that to us or you want to hang on to that and show it to other people. Hang it on your wall. No. <laughs> you can. Um, you can also give it out uh, or show it to others or use the form, I mean, for other people if you want them to be an ally as well. And then at the end of our workshops, I don't know how many we have of us with us this time. No, the, the symbol, the sticker. It's that one. It's that one. Yeah. I'm not, if we don't have enough of these, I will be happy to send some to Dr. Leiden. Um, but these we have a decal that I would love to see Dr. James have one on his now that he has been through the workshop. Dr. Poussin and I have them on our doors. It's a, it's a decal that says Allies for Inclusion Ability Ally. You can put it on your door and actually it's removable. You could put it on a binder or whatever you wanted and you could take it um, and put it somewhere else. But it shows then that you are an ally for people with disabilities, and if people will, might feel comfortable being around you, uh, talking, 
if they want to or not, but they know that you are an, are an ally. It's kind of like if you've heard of safe zone uh, for people um, who are um, who uh, um, the LGBT community. Um, and there's another one about bullying. There's a cult, isn't it blue? Anyway, there are different things, but uh, this is the Ability Ally one. And you would be the first, oh, who's gonna put it up? It's St. Mary's in England. This is exciting. I, I would love to see that on the door. Put it up and we'll take a picture. Anyway, no, I, we really appreciate it. This has been so nice to have you here. We want you to share and participate in and experience the exhibit. Um, and we are so proud uh, to be here and grateful and humble to be with you tonight. Thank you so much. I don't quite know where to start. I've under strict instructions from John to say that um, rather than have a formal Q&A because of timing, we might just shift over and have some wine and actually just circulate and chat with Karen and, and Mark themselves. In, in pulling it together, it's been an enormous pleasure to listen, no, actually not to listen to experience your talk. It's about, it's very catching, the manner in which you communicate your passion and commitment to this. And there are various things that, that have, have, have struck me, but rather than go through them, what I was thinking of towards the end was, you know the song, you've got to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative and step right up to the affirmative, don't mess with Mr. In-Between. And I just thought, because you have, you've got to accentuate the positive, which is the personal first language. You've got to eliminate the negative, which is linked with that. You've got to step right up to the affirmative, which is the I will. And we don't mess up, Mr. In Between. So thank you so, so much. Please have some wine and please uh, do talk to Karen and Mark. But it's been, uh, not in, just in terms of our own practice, but I'm sitting here thinking institutionally of what we can do and link it with our, our student service and well-being uh, service. Um, and I, I will certainly w would want to share your PowerPoint with them and indeed make a connection there because it's not just about how we practice within ourselves, it's about how we can inform our institutions um, about the great work that you're doing and how we can build upon that here. Thank you so much. Thank you.